So we are at our Weston Master Suite project this week. Uh, we have made a ton of progress. Uh, the framing is just about complete. The guys are working on mechanical layout and we got our radiant floor 100% done. Uh, there's a, a lot of detail in this framing. You know, we've talked about how the end result is really important with tolerances, just like our Comav project. We're dealing with 30 seconds and here we're actually not doing a base detail at all. What we call is a museum base. Uh, so we're actually bringing our plaster just about a quarter inch away from top of finished floor and we're using a similar shadow, be uh, shadow reglet detail as we are over in Boston. Um, but we'll have this consistent shadow of one quarter of an inch above finished floor. Again, just like Com Ave, we have to be, we have to actually install our floor before we plaster to maintain that uh, tolerance because a 32nd of an inch, you're gonna see that discrepancy. Um, but I wanna talk about a couple things. You know, this right here being our shower, uh, this is a standard detail for all our curbless showers. You can see the guys did a really great job of re recessing this subfloor. So this here is our finished subfloor. Uh, and this is also our finished subfloor to allow for a pitched linear drain up to a level surface. Um, before I say some wrong thing, are we putting radiant there or no? There'll be the electric oh, yeah. schluter. I forgot about that. So okay. we ran. What was the reason for hydronic. electric? Like why do electric under the tile? Just to use the whole schluter system over here. And that's what the architect has specced out. Gotcha. Okay. where we make the hard transition here the the wood flooring comes in wraps back in and you're recording right okay in in the tiled areas the architect wanted us to use the you know a heated mat so and radiant then, throughout the rest of the space yeah, hydronic radiant over here everywhere that is tile so i'm just going to flip this up here yep. so you can actually see the hydronic we're standing in the bathroom but we actually have two floors in the bathroom right yeah so we have this hard transition from saru's white oak to a large, large format tile. Mega slabs. So right now you guys have this plain plywood matching our uh, height of our hydronic. Yep. So when you do the Schluter Dietra and tile, you should be equal distance we'll to our three quarter inch. It. Yep, three quarter. It's an engineered rift white oak. So that, that there you get the, the smooth transition working our way in. We have this kind of uh, you know odd shaped shower where the tile comes in. This is your tile break line and you recess this, this, this plywood down to your linear drain and running that dietra right to our linear drain just yep. like we do almost on, on every everything. project. Uh, which is great because you have three quarters of an inch plus a half inch, yep. giving you an inch and a quarter to pitch and to feet. that drain. Because yep. this, is this isn't a real big spot for drainage. No. You know, you, we're gonna have multiple shower heads, yeah. um, but we do have the advantage of the shower growing and having a big piece of glass here to really and caps yeah, like that. Yeah, a whole glass wall coming across here. So. And a tub, the tub in the corner. So we've talked about this on a previous episode is we have everything working against us. Yeah. Uh, and it's really important that we're working with one system. So Schluter in this case, making sure that we have a completely water and vapor tight system. Because yeah. this is a, like you have a tub, shower heads, and it's also becoming like a, ste it's a steam shower or steam room. Right, and the steam... Well, right. It's a steam room. <laughs> I, like, I like the fact that you say room. We have windows in here, which that's its own kind of animal. We're switching these to single uh, pane. Yep, single pane. Not single pane, but well, si one big piece of glass. Fixed. Yeah. Right. And we're working with Rich Costa on these really cool aluminum extension jams that will get essentially glazed to the glass, right? Yeah, they'll get glazed right to the glass and they like flare out and our tile's going to die into the backside of it. It's going to be a... Really lot, cool, clean, like modern touch on those windows. A lot, a lot of coordination, especially from that waterproofing detail, detail. And this right here, our tub drain, this is something that we talked about before and we dealt with in other showers is this is a wet room. A lot of times that drain has a really weak connection where yeah. if water was rolling underneath the tub, it could get under. That has to be water and vapor tight too. So if we gave it much thought on how we're making that connection with the tub, they, um, the tub company actually has a flange that we can use that will seal all that stuff up. So am I, am I picturing this right? That, that you, you set that, you seal it to the floor and you drop the tub and it makes a yep. positive connection. Yep. That's great. Cause that's, I mean, that's a weak point in this steam room that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, I also see some duct work in the shower. Yeah. So this is actually like, I think my favorite detail, we're going to tuck our vent up inside the top of the niche. 
when you look at it, you're going to have your niche with your, so your floating shelves. This yep. is all tile here. All tile. You and guys have gonna... run some duct work down to the, the ceiling of our niche. Yep. And that detail, what's that detail going to look like? Um, we're going to use the tileable vent cover that you slip up and in there, and you're just going to have a nice clean reveal around the outside of it, and it's going to hide it. Now this is, we, we have an existing remote fan in this bathroom that yep. we're working with for the toilet room and the bathroom in general, but we've opted to actually add a secondary standalone fan just for the steam shower, yeah. uh, which will be controlled off a timer, uh, which when they're done with the steam shower, they can come out, set a timer, and it will exhaust you yep. know, any of the, the residual vapor. And this is gonna go right to a fan, which leads me to this empty cavity. This is where that fan's gonna sit, right? Yep, we're gonna have a fan and we're actually gonna utilize that space to put the steam generator in there as well. So I know you had met with uh, the homeowners on this and yep. how do we access this? Uh, we have this really cool wood slat wall, which we'll get to in a future episode, but now we're standing in our master bedroom. bedroom. We have this curved wall with a big plaster art niche. We talked about adding an access panel, but the, the challenge there is we have this curved wall. So Ken and his team, they're going to actually bend laminate in the shop, build a jig to make a big MDF panel that's going to fill this whole space uh, and allow that steam generator to live back there. Yep. You'll be able to slide the generator in there. You'll be able to get back there and service it if you ever had to. And, um, you know, it's going to, that access panel is going to essentially blend right into the back of that and you're not even going to know it's there. You made a great point in that meeting too, is that, you know, we're going to obviously make that the entire size because if we had seams in the middle, then it's more noticeable. Yeah. So we would have these minimal seams around, but should, you know, the reality is you're not going to be really servicing this thing that much. It should maintain itself. They're self-cleaning. Yep. So you could actually cock that in. No, as long as you knew and probably had some sort of mechanical lock up here where yep. you could reach in, mm -hmm. unlock it and tilt it down and in. Um, one thing that we, we, we came up with is, I, I mentioned self-cleaning, this thing needs to drain. A really important note is you cannot drain that into PVC. No, uh, it has to be copper. And why is that? Heat. PVC, I believe, is only rated for, it's like 150 or 160. And it's not even the self-cleaning mode on this, because like the self-cleaning is going to just clean with like your average temperature water. If this has an issue there's a um, like a pressure relief that will blow off and if that happens and it went into pvc it would melt it all because we're, we're at over 200 degrees at that yeah. point and i mean it's actually something we found in the previous system because it was a steam shower here and it yeah. was draining into pvc yep so have we found a path to get downstairs put you on the spot here yeah we're by putting it back there, we're going to be able to run along the back wall and we're actually doing a renovation down in the living room. And there's a dead space in one of the cabinets where they already have a big plumbing chase and we'll be able to sneak some plumbing lines down to the we'll basement. We'll get that down to the existing cast iron, uh, essentially plumbing that is leaving this house. Being an old house, the cast iron is um, you know, pretty common. Yeah. Uh, it's, what's interesting is in cer circumstances, especially new construction, I, and I wonder, this is a question that uh, I'm asking kind of, everyone a lot of this stuff is pvc in these new homes you're, you're not you're not traditionally switching to cast so i wonder what the right approach might be uh, in a case where you're building a new home where do you drain that um, i know we talked about you know if it runs over a certain distance in copper it's probably losing a lot of temperature you know maybe that's the the consideration is that you're you're, you're figuring out how long does it take to drop to a suitable temperature to be dumped into pvc and how do you achieve that yeah, it's definitely something to keep in mind if you, you know, you're doing a renovation or building a new house and you're going to have a steam generator, just making sure you think of all those little details to make sure, you know, to avoid any issues down the road. Yeah. So in this master bath, uh, I'm sorry, master bedroom, bedroom here, yeah. um, we got the, the adjacent wall has an art niche as well. I want to get to that HVAC detail because that is stellar, but we have this pocket door detail. Yeah. Um, you know, we worked with Mike over at HD Pocket Doors, uh, and he had spec'd out this Hawa Junior. Junior 80. Junior 80, which I think it's a relatively newer product, for at least for him. Yeah. Because um, we were talking about the complications between this, de this door. This door actually doesn't hit this wall on uh, a flat surface. The door is actually beveled. You know, we're floor to ceiling, so we actually don't have any cavity for any hardware to be hidden. Yep. Um, it's... it's extremely tall it's extremely detailed it's extremely heavy. heavy how do we service this 
And this hardware actually allows you to take the door out really easy. Yeah. I, I, really easy compared to what we've seen in the past. Not necessarily easy, but it's designed so you can get it set up, put the door in, make sure it works, and remove it, and allow you to finish. Because one of the issues that we've dealt with is painting and sanding and dust getting in this equ equipment, making them loud over time. Yeah. Um, what about, you know, I love that you guys... Yeah, just painting up the inside, just so when that door is, you know, open, you always end up seeing just like a little bit of the edge there. So we just, you know, paint it up black, just kind of have it blend in with the shadows. But. Same thing with this plywood. This gives you, you know, this becomes that wood slat wall. Gives yeah. you a lot of nailing surface, you know. And gluing and nailing. This, yeah. I mean, this is is clutch because this was one of the posts that we had to move yep and it looks like it landed exactly where it needed to land yeah so that ends up allowing that pocket door to fit yep we can just squeak it by there and we end up just wrapping around this corner having it die into the opening of the pocket door and uh, you know for finding that little surprise after demo i think you know working with the architects is a great solution yeah I'm, I'm excited to see this door and I know we're gonna, uh, the goal is to get this fabricated ahead of time so we can test it, oh, pull yeah. it out, finish it, get it in and have it protected so it's there, we know it works rather than waiting to finish to get this thing hung, which I assume is why you haven't finished this, this pocket, right? Yep, yeah, we wanna get everything up there mounted, make sure the stops are in the right spot and everything's working before we uh, nail that home. So generally speaking, you know, our traditional details of centering, HVAC yeah. outlets. Yeah. Cooper's been working on layout for plumbing and electrical locations, yep. switches, lights, everything. Everything. Making sure all of this stuff is hitting architecturally. Um, but you guys came up with a, a, a great solution. I think this was, you know, uh, partly Rich. Um, yeah, Rich did a great job working with, um, it was Andy from uh, our HVAC, guy. Yeah, HVAC company that we've been working with on this project. So niche, what's going on up here? So we're running into issues. So we're pulling all the return air is actually being pulled from like over at the entryway. And now it wasn't an issue before because you had doorways into the room and everything was open. Um, now that's our only doorway. So you shut that door. How do we connect this space? And we're trying to For come up. For return air. Yeah. Because we yeah. have supply. We got some plenty of supply, but pulling the return back. Right. Basically filling this room like a balloon. How do you then equalize the pressure? Yep. Uh, so we're trying to come up with a really creative way and like we started talking about doing like a jump duct to connect the two spaces but with the, the framing and the steel that we have in the way and then we have this light detail out there and there's grates on the ceiling we went back and forth probably a hundred times with like different ideas and trying to come up with something and, and you know, the, out of the norm so it looks right i was gonna say just let's be honest it's really easy to add a jump duct and call yeah, yeah, yeah. call good good but when, you know, the conversation was more of, all right, well, that does solve it, but is there a way to do it more? It's gonna be ugly, yeah. Right, and I think there was a lot of inspiration from that detail in the shower yeah. pulled to this niche here. So that's, you're actually gonna be using that as your return chase. We're actually gonna do a plastered in grill on the top of the niche. So when this is all done, you got your nice plastered niche and you're just gonna have a couple slats up top. I believe it was Andy that did all the calculations with, you know, how much air it has to be able to get through there. It's a pretty crazy design, right? Because we're using actually like part of the ceiling and part of the wall cavity to get enough air to go across and connect these two spots. So Essentially trying to move a certain amount of cubic, you know, inches, cubic inches of right. air yeah. and out through square inches of air. And yeah. Their calculation basically netted us with this size uh, grill on this side. And if you, we flip around to uh, one of the closets, yeah. you actually see it's ended up in a, a position where uh, it actually was, you know, it worked out really well. There's no cabinetry, there's nothing there, and it's hidden out of the way, making almost a direct shot back to our central return air. Yep. So let's, why don't we pop out there and take a look at that. So this is one of the closets. Uh, we have two closets in this master suite. And this is, is that how big the grill is gonna be? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking at that. I'm like, that looks a lot no. bigger than no, no, no. the bedroom side. No. Walk me through what we have going on in this wall here. Cabinetry on both sides. And we just, we made this giant box essentially to get enough air to come across. And then we're going to end up plastering in. And it's just going to be a couple of little slats up on the wall. Uh, Andy has all the, you know, the specs for um, the spacing and the length of it. Sure. So we'll make sure we work with him, get that all laid out. But Ultimately, when we're done, it's just going to be a very clean plastered in grill that like 
is going to blend almost in. What's really important to note, you keep referencing, you know, Andy having these calculations, and there's yes. a lot more than just how much air has to be moved through. And I think you started to allude to it is that the size of the, the slots and the size of what's restricting the air yep. is important. You know, maybe not as much in a jump duck, but in duck work in general, that you don't want whistling. You, you really want this to be quiet. You want air to be able to pass through freely. So making sure that it's sized correctly, but it's also that the restriction of the air passing through the grills and the registers uh, was, you know, con well considered. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I know from experience, even in my own home, I have registers that whistle. Yeah, we uh, don't It's probably one of the most annoying things uh, that I overlooked. Yeah. Um, but another great detail is painting this black. So I assume you guys are going to do that on the other side. Yep. Um, and then this just, any anytime you do have a viewpoint of inside that register, it's black. It's, it's, it's sight unseen at that point. Closet number one, we have another closet on the other side. Uh, you've been working with Ken in the shop. You guys are putting all the millwork together. Yep. A lot of custom millwork in here. You know, this is our entry to this suite. Uh, and the first thing that you're going to see is all this really great millwork, which actually uh, I posted on my story yesterday, a pivot door mock-up. Uh, all of these doors behind me are actually pivot doors. They're really thick, about two and a half inches thick finish, a, I believe. Yeah, finish at two and a half. It's a two and a quarter inch door with a quarter inch mirror on the face of it. And some of the reasons why we're going two and a quarter on that door thickness is to make sure that these mirrors stay really, really flat. Yeah. You know, when you start getting distortion in the mirror is when, you know, you either look skinny or fat. <laughs> so you want to you want to look true in that mirror, obviously. Yeah. But we, we, we did a mock up in the shop with a hinge. We were looking at the Fitzjurgen. Yeah, an amazing hinge really, really works well. Unfortunately, it just has a bigger offset that works. So we're actually going back to what the architect inspect and using a Rickson. Rickson, yeah. Uh, and they're a free flowing pivot hinge. It's and we, still a great hinge. Yeah, it's a fantastic hinge. My concern and what we've really solved is how do we get this positive stop? Uh, when the door is shut, we want them to hold shut and have a nice, you know, uh, soft close. Not soft closing, but soft sound. So adding yeah, you don't want to like you know rattle or banging you know, off bang wood, around. right? So yeah. we've added this rubber de this rubber bumper as well as we're also talking about using rare earth magnets to hold yep. it shut. Um, but let's talk about the f the real focal of this spot is this 96 inch flush mounted LED light. I feel we just talked about in ComAv. Again, we're using these essentially blown up versions of our under cab lighting. The aluminum track that goes in is roughly four inches wide by four inches tall. And it has an LED strip in it with um, built in flanges so we can you know, set that. And then when the plaster comes through, we can use straight edges and screed this whole area out, making sure it you know, ends up perfectly flush, nice flat ceiling and have that, you know, integrated look. And this gets essentially an LED tape light with a diffuser on it, yep. just like our under cabinet Same lighting. Thing. Like you said, it's dead flat. So when it's off, it really should be white on white. Yep. And when it's lit up, the intention here is that we are in this kind of circular space and have all these mirrors that you're able to kind of utilize wherever you're standing and getting this really well uh, cast light over uh, the entire space. Yeah, plus all the recess lighting too. That's what all the tape. So, so there's recess within this circle. Yep. So you guys have, are basically mapping out your 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 quadrants of this uh, circle light and then locating your light. Yep. So Which using the string line allows us to see exactly where it is. And then this also gives us a good visual because if you look, we have a recess light going in up here. And that's just not enough clearance to get, you know, the housing for that recessed light. So now, you know, getting all the strings up and you know, it's going to give us a good visual of what blocking we need to move around, add some blocking in other spots, make sure that everybody has plenty of room to get what they need done. So I'm looking up and I'm seeing that you got a string line, a piece of tape, and it says light with an arrow. Center you point. Know, center point. So yep. you're, you're basically showing that edge of tape and where that intersects the string yeah, it's is more, your, your center point. Yeah, it's more pointing out that we got little Sharpie marks on the light, um, on the string where the light goes. And it's kind of, if you don't know about it, it's going to be pretty easy to walk by and be like, oh yeah, they just have string up there doing what? Right. You know? So we're making this sure. This is that opportunity to, you know, prep for the electrician who will be here, you know, in a few days to get this stuff laid out. So when he shows up, he's not overwhelmed. Like, hey, that blocks in my way. <laughs> yeah. You know, we can really, you know, maximize efficiency with that. Yep. Stay ahead of him.
Um, same thing with the plumbing too. You know, I want to I want to loop back over here. We talked about the radiant. Uh, we talked about the shower, the niche. Yeah. Um, but now we have this section here where you know we have a floating vanity, but and this looks to be the toilet. Well, this is actually the toilet closet, and the, so there's no wall here. There is no wall. This toilet room is actually it's only separated by a piece of frosted glass that's going to run. Um, you know, floor to ceiling, we got a wall carrier, so it's a wall mounted toilet going here. And it's actually, we have a little bump out to um, house the wall carrier because we, we are dealing with an exterior wall. So that's all, why this plumbing is inboard here. Yep, just to get everything inside so it stays nice and warm. We don't have to worry about any pipes freezing. But on the side of this bump out, we actually have a really cool detail into the tile. This all gets wrapped with tile and we're doing more uh, essentially like our under cabinet lighting up either side of it to give this a really cool detail. Interesting. So is that all the lighting in this space? No, there's actually two recess lights. Two too. recess lights and this, and that. this uh, recessed light. That recessed light's also in our millwork, yep. which when our millwork's open in the side of our cabinetry is going to be ran up too. As we're, as we're talking about this, I'm realizing really how much electrical and there's, lighting is going to be in this space. A ton. It's, it's going to be quite bright. Uh, yes. with the Sru's white oak floors, which are going to look uh, incredible. Question we keep getting, everyone wants to know why you we're using fiberglass insulation we're and not. why we did such a crappy job. We're not. It's just the existing that's there. And uh, we're doing this renovation over the winter right. and we got to keep the space, you know, pretty comfortable. So, so hopefully that, that reinstills your confidence in us that we'll yeah, do a we better job. Yeah, we are not leaving this. This will not stay. <laughs> Despite finding holes in the existing insulation, what are we doing for insulation in here? Because, you know, there's been a lot of talk in, in best practice and, and health concerns and things like that. Yeah. What, what did we end up and what is our plan in this space? So our plan is rock wool and then use the Sega Myrex on the inside to, you know, wrap around and seal the space up. And then one of their biggest concerns with the homeowner is um, sound too. So before the floor went down, I, we filled the cavity with rock wool. That really cut down on the sound. And then we'll wrap this room, we'll do the ceiling. And then we're actually talking about doing some of those interior walls too. So when they're in their bedroom, they're, they don't hear anything. Right, nice and quiet. It's, it's more comfortable. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you know we, we filled the floor cavity with rock wool. I know we also had a pretty deep cavity. So we 16 actually had, inches. Yeah, we had, a, we had an air gap which is great for sound yep. control where you have an air gap and then that rock yeah. insulation so for sound. I guess I shouldn't say we filled the cavity, but because well, we did have a little bit of an air gap and then we- You filled we, the majority of a 16 inch cavity. Yeah, there we there's go. a ton of rock wool in there. What was their response to that? Because I know in construction, like they could hear this conversation. Now, oh, how, absolutely. how's it been? No complaints now. That's great. And so they're saying even now, like, it, so down below us, there's actually like a big living room, a kitchen. They actually have five kids. So when all the kids are home and they're trying to, they're right now they're sleeping in one of the bedrooms on the third floor, they can still hear everything. And it's like, all right, then we put all the rock wool in and it made it, you know, say 80% better. And so they're really excited to see how well the rock wool performs once we finish up everything. So right now we're in that, that rough stage. Our next steps are really getting electrical and plumbing. Yep. HVAC, you look like you guys are, you're pretty much topped off with with that scope. Yep, HVAC, uh, AV, um, security, uh, they're done. Electrical will be here at the beginning of next week. Plumbing, they've uh, done most of their roughs. We're just waiting on a few valves to show up. They'll set that stuff and then they'll be, you know, wrapped up. They only really have a day's left worth of plumbing, so. And then we roll into, which is out, outside of the norm, our floors and then plaster. Yeah. And that's when, you know, this starts coming together, you know, as a finished space we start rolling into finishes. There's a ton of millwork here. Um, that's when that, I feel as though that's where that seesaw kind of tips. It's like, all right, you, you made it over that hump. Now it's, we're running downhill, getting everything put together. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna say downhill yet. Just cause the level right, of then, detail here. Then we'll plateau we're, we're, for a little bit. Yeah, we're leveling off. Okay, fair. Uh, especially cause we're, you know, like you said, we're flipping our normal process around. And so that in itself has its own challenges. What are your biggest concerns with doing the floor first? It's a Saru's white oak, man. So like being able to protect the floor because everybody's still going to be in here working. So we're going to have a whitewash floor with guys still working on it. Why and do you, why do we have to do that finish before we plaster? Why can't uh, we just install our wood floor? So with that little base detail, it's a, like you were saying earlier, quarter inch reveal. And once you come through, we install the flooring, you sand it. 
if there's any lippage underneath that little shadow reveal, you're going to see it. Right. So we want to make sure we get this floor, spend the time, sand it nice and flat, and then we're going to have to get the whitewash on it and protect it. And, you know, it's just going to, we're going to have to slow down. And it's, you know, it's important where, depending on the, really the temperature and the weather outside is, you know, we have radiant underneath this floor. So getting the floor in here, making sure it acclimates correctly, you know, making sure it's stacked the way the manufacturer yep. recommends. It's acclimated, the moisture content is right. The moisture content of the, the this space is correct. Mm -hmm. The radiant is running, you know, making sure that we're running the heat and make, and have all of everything that is going to be controlling the, the the climate in this space active so it's as close 100. yeah as close to how it's going to day be day to day yeah day to day yeah, yeah to make sure that we're doing everything to maintain that floor uh the expansion and contraction you know that we're going to experience with wood uh in preparation for install finish prep uh protect and then plaster yeah it's gonna be tough we got it we can do it well, that's all we have this week at our Weston project. Uh, stay tuned for the next episode as we roll into, uh, well, not the downhill, but some of the, the finer details yeah. when we get into our hardwood. Tile is going to be a great, uh, a really uh, um, great look into large format install. Yeah. Um, some of those tiles are 48 by 48, yeah, 48 like by 96. Yeah, there's like five tiles in this entire bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> it's so crazy. It's, I think there's a, there, there's a lot of uh, cool means and methods on how we're going to do that and walk you through kind of what we're proposing to make that waterproof and steam proof or vapor proof. Uh, but as always, guys, we appreciate you watching. Make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications. We'll see you next time.